The hiring manager makes an offer, then HR comes in behind their back and changes it to a lower amount. What should you do? Well, stick around because in this video, I'm gonna break down how I would interpret this scenario. Hey everybody, it's Brian from A Life After Layoff. Today, I'm gonna to be breaking down a scenario where somebody gets an offer from a hiring manager directly, then HR comes in behind the scenes and actually changes that offer and makes it less appealing to you. So we're gonna break this one down in just a minute, but before we get too far into it, if you're interested in more videos directly from a corporate recruiter, an HR professional, and a career coach, make sure you hit that subscribe button and you might also wanna hit that notification bell. All right, here's the job offer scenario. So let's break this one down and figure out how you should address it. So this person says that they are newly graduated with a biochemistry degree, so they're entry level, and they landed a research assistant job in New York City. So they're going to, it looks like they're gonna to apply to med school in 2024. And I wanna explain the situation in sequential order. Okay, so first job out of school, it's really the most important job to try to get because that's going to make it a lot easier for future jobs when you don't have any experience at all. Trying to convince an employer to give you a shot, it's like kind of the chicken with, uh, or the egg. Which one comes first? You don't have the experience, so you can't get the job. You don't have the job, so you can't get experience. So getting that first job is crucially important. So let's kind of asterisk that uh, assumption for a second. So upon interview with the private investigator, or in other words, the head of the lab, she offered me a $50,000 a year job with benefits, so health insurance, and this candidate promptly said yes. So this is the hiring manager making this offer directly to the employee. So then it continues that got a call from HR, not an email, so they actually physically called last Friday. Now as I record this, this is a Sunday, so let's just assume this is a two or three days ago that this happened. And she says that her request to hire me for $50,000 a year was rejected. And instead, uh, the $47,000 per year was offered. So, I mean, it's not insignificant when you look at this roughly, what, 6% decrease in compensation. And at $50,000 a year, you know, the three k does, it, you know, that, that's more meaningful than somebody that's maybe making over a hundred. So that is a, you know, that would be a disappointment, uh, especially when it's already been verbalized that the offer is going out at a certain amount. So we'll come back to that and I'll asterisk that. Um, the next bullet point here says that I asked the question for a reason, the salary committee, and the salary committee is usually a comp person and they may uh, sit in an HR department or it might be in finance, but the, the salary committee rejected uh, because I did not have relevant paid research experiences, although I had unpaid research internship of six to 10 years. Uh, I, I guess like the relative paid research experiences, if this is an entry level position, I'm wondering what the paid versus unpaid, the internship, why would that really matter? Um, nonetheless, they're holding her to that, that uh, requirement. Um, and she actually had the, this unpaid research internship of six to 10 hours per week at their institute for an entire year. So. Um, HR said they would not consider that uh, as um, to count towards this experience to get her to the said the, the originally agreed upon salary. So let's let's break this all down first, and then we'll move on to the rest of it. In general, how an offer process works is that a hiring manager, once we get to the point of having an all inclined loop, so say you have a panel of, of, of people who agree to thumbs up a candidate to, yeah, to give somebody an offer. Typically at that point, in most major organizations, the recruiter would work with the hiring manager. Now I'm talking the internal corporate recruiter, not an external headhunter, but the internal corporate recruiter would work with the hiring manager to, A, they would give a recommendation for what the compensation should be, and then they would work with the hiring manager and usually an HR business partner to come up with what the compensation should be. And they might do some salary discovery, some salary surveys, they might look at internal compensation for other people in similar roles, et cetera. And then usually once the offer details have been landed on, it then goes through an approval chain. So it would go, usually it goes to the, the hiring manager would be the first one, then the hiring manager's plus one. So the hiring manager's boss would usually be the second person to sign off. And then it usually goes to an HR, person for a third sign off and then it would loop back to the recruiter and in most organizations that I've worked in the recruiter then would give the the verbal offer to the candidate and then send the written offer and the reason why they do that is because hiring managers have no, been known to go rogue and give offer details or commit to things that that business is not capable of committing to it causes a lot of problems it's just 
better to have it under a talent acquisition and or a human resource group, depending on the size of the organization, but keeping it under one roof where there's a consistent message because then you avoid stuff like this. So if indeed the salary expectation or the salary committee said that it was only a 47,000 based on the metric that they had or the, the matrix that they had, um, the wage matrix, the 47 K a year should have been the only thing that was communicated to it. So now I wonder, I'm wondering if the hiring manager went rogue and said some things that she shouldn't have said. Uh, which is probably the most likely scenario in this in this uh, in this circumstance. That being said, usually if I have a hiring manager that goes rogue and we find out about it and we go and try to revise an offer and they say, "Hey, I actually already gave the offer to the candidate," then we have to go back and say, "Okay, do we want to rescind the offer and revise it, or do we want to just raise up to the new level?" Um, and make an exception, or yeah, there, there's a, a few different options. Typically, those would be the two major ones. For me, looking at forty-seven thousand, the three thousand dollar decrease, I, I just I feel like it's a little bit petty to be messing with three thousand dollars. I mean, and not, and not say the three thousand dollars isn't significant for the organization, but it's probably more significant for the employee. And if it's already been verbalized, it's a internal process control thing. It's a shame on the organization for allowing that to happen as, as opposed to the, uh, the candidate. So I would probably, as a, the recruiter, I would probably um, advocate for the candidate to just, we just should, should keep at the 50K that we committed to, even though and, you know, that wasn't what we should have done. And then circle back with the hiring manager and say, why did you commit to that? Um, but again, process control, really the recruiter should be the one who's giving this offer because then you avoid all of these issues to begin with. So we go to the next bullet point and it says that in addition, after three months of probation, my, my boss essentially can request a salary increase to 50 K a year. And once it's approved, I can get, uh, I can get paid as accordingly. And that's somewhat common. Um, typically, they would want somebody to stay a certain amount of time before they just give them the extra comp if they're making an exception. So that's not like super unusual. Um, the one thing I'd say, the three month probationary period, I, I have heartburn over that. And I would imagine a lot of labor attorneys would have heartburn over the three month, the probationary period. Because once you state a probationary period, it's essentially you're entering into a, con a contractual relationship where you guarantee that this person will be on rolls for or payroll for at least three months. And if it's an at-will employer, I'm not sure if I'm, I would assume that in New York and New York City is an at-will. Um, if you put in a probationary period, there could be an argument made that it circumvents or nullifies at-will employment. So then it's actually to the benefit of the employee to have a three-month probation. Because in an at-will employer, they could terminate you after three months, two months, one week. It does, doesn't really matter. They don't have to have a reason. So there's no point in having a probationary period um, other than it basically is to the disadvantage for the employer and to the advantage for the employee. So if you got terminated at week two, in theory, you could probably go file suit saying I was on a three month probation. They didn't get me to three months. I need, I should be paid to three months and you could probably, you might be able to win. Um, I'm not a labor attorney, so you should go seek somebody if, if you're in that situation. But the next bullet point says that um, my HR wants my answer by tomorrow. My PI, the head of the lab is not going to be back until the 28th, which is, looks like it's probably after the holiday. So it's like a week later, like a week or 10 days later. So apparently the hiring manager made this, she went on vacation, they, they, she made the offer, then promptly went on vacation and behind the scenes, HR is doing all this stuff and revising things. Um, so she's saying that she's been, um, hasn't been on email since her vacation and I highly doubt that she knows about this. So the issue that I have with this is that HR is going rogue, not looping the hiring manager in on a potential change, which could cause some problems between the HR department and the hiring manager. And the HR making this, this, mis this mistake and then requiring the candidate basically to not have any notice to consider the offer. Um, in this case, they want your answer by tomorrow, but you don't have to give them your answer. There's no requirement there. I mean, in theory, sure, they could pull your offer if they've got somebody else that's in the wings as a, as a candidate plan B. 
Um, but they would certainly upset the hiring manager if they came in, rescinded this person's offer, they ended up leaving, and then they ended up hiring somebody else in their place. Um, that would certainly probably not sit well with the department head. She's thinking about replying to them, uh, basically saying, um, basically replying to HR saying, how about we wait until my PI comes back and work from there? I want everybody, especially my PI, to be on the same page before moving on. And I would absolutely agree with that. I would request, let's wait till they get back and, and, and see. I think that that's a reasonable expectation. And then see if your boss can go and advocate for you. In a lot of cases, they'll be able to pull some strings or do something unique for you. Maybe it's a sign-on bonus. Maybe you ask for a 3K sign-on bonus, and after six months, they would reevaluate um, your... Um, your your, uh, your base salary. And then she's saying, I can't afford to do job hunting again because all the other hospitals I applied to have not moved forward with my application even though I submitted 19 applications. So again, you have a few different choices that you can do. You, number one is you can try to wait for the, the, the hiring manager to come back and have a chat with everybody. Whether or not the hiring manager will hold enough weight to get past or push the compensation uh, committee and HR, they may not have that power. Uh, it may kind of the buck may stop at HR. It just depends on the organization. Um, the second thing that they could do is they could just accept the offer as is, swallow it up, and it's not a great first impression for the candidate. And you know, hopefully you can get over it. Uh, it's not a, not the way that we would want somebody to start their first day on a job is feeling like they were shafted on some level. Um, or the, th the third option is, is that you can decide to withdraw or renegotiate the offer. It doesn't sound like this company has a lot of wiggle room with their, um, with their compensation, or you probably won't be able to negotiate this offer a whole lot, but I would certainly go back and ask for a 3K sign-on bonus to make me whole for the first year, and then determine salary based on my experience at that. And let's circle back to the very first thing is, in an entry-level job, you're getting your first job out of school is the most important one. It's the hardest one for you to get. So I know some folks um, that follow this channel are trying to get their first uh, first jobs in, in industry, and it is difficult. That that's the hardest one because again, you're you're you don't have any experience to lean back on to sell yourself on, and it's based all on potential. And at that point, you have to weigh how important the three K is in the, in the grand scheme of thing is 3000 a lot. Yeah. It's a, it's a decent amount of money. It's not nothing to sneeze at, but in the bigger picture, having that first job under your belt, you'll easily make that three K up later on. But I think if it was me, I would want to get that first, uh, that, that, that experience I would request to ask HR, especially because next week's going to be a shortened week. It's going into the holiday. Um, that can we wait till the hiring manager gets back and revisit this on the following Monday after the holiday? I think it's like Thanksgiving as I record this, just so you're aware. But, um, and I think this is when she's writing it. So on the following Monday, when everybody's back in the office, then revisit it. I think that's where I would push and then maybe suggest or try to counter with a $3,000 sign-up bonus. And if they say this is hard and fast, it's 47,000 and that's it, take it or leave it, then make a decision. It sounds like in this, in this case, it might be a job that you'd want to take to get the experience, but know that you're getting kind of caught up in petty uh, corporate stuff that happens. When we look at getting your first job, especially in a market that is not the best, we're heading, as I record this, we're heading into a little bit of an iffy job market, lots of layoffs happening, maybe something that you just want to bite on it and, um, you know, and, and, uh, get the job, get the experience, and then see what happens going forward. Anyway, if you're having struggles in your job search yourself and you want a little bit more advice on how to do it, I do offer some private one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. You can reach me through my website for that. But if you're not getting any interviews at all and assuming that you're a reasonable fit for the jobs that you're applying to, it's almost always a resume issue. And you wanna learn how to write a resume that's gonna give you the highest likelihood of getting that first round interview call. And that's why I created Resume Rocket Fuel, which is designed to teach you how to write a resume that's gonna give you the best chance of getting that recruiter to notice you so that they pick up the phone and call you for that first round interview. It includes templates, also includes how to customize your resume, which is gonna be a really important component of your job search going forward. So if you're struggling with your resume and you're not getting any interviews, I'd highly encourage you to check that one out. And additionally, once you get that first round interview, it's then up to you to sell yourself to get through the rest of the interviewing process. And that's where I created the Ultimate Job Seeker Bootcamp 
which is essentially interview training to take you through each round, methodically breaking down what it is that you need to do, how you can position yourself to ace each step of that interview process and to land that offer. So if you're struggling in your job search, I would highly encourage you to check those courses out. Appreciate you watching. Hopefully this was helpful to some of you and we will see you on the next one.